Christian, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study so that things will be eternally secure. And this is a very special Wednesday night because I happen to have with me two saints who came all the way from Texas to visit um, my wife and me here in Las Vegas, uh, Mark and Cheryl Albright. And I want you guys to introduce them before we get, get to anything else. Um, I've known Mark since 1983. We met when I lived in Texas, and I was just so happy to get the report that uh, Mark and Cheryl both are believers, and they understand Amen. and believe the gospel as we did. Well, um, who is that in the background? It, it looks like a couple of saints. Yeah, they're, they're <laughs> definitely a couple of saints. No doubt. You can tell by looking, can't you? Yes, I so sure can. You, you know, know looks like I'm just different around, like though. that. I can tell, uh, I can tell if you're saved just like yeah. that. Well, we're glad to be here to observe this dear part of it. Amen. Thank God. Hey, nice to meet you. We drove two days from Texas and just got here today. Wow. I look tired. I've been driving all day. What part of Texas? Oh, uh, Longview, East Texas. Wow. Wow. You can make it. Well, I'm glad you made it safely. What's, what's your name, ma'am? Carol. Carol and Mark. Mark, yes. Yeah. Mark. And I also uh, learned from Carol tonight that uh, uh, they owned and operated a Christian store, a retail store, and uh, it was oh. called Amazing Grace. And they sold Christian, was it? Christian jewelry and shirts and stuff like that. Yeah. Wow. Isn't that great? Did you put, you got to get that online so yeah. we can support it. Well, they had wow. to, they closed it down a few years ago, but they had it here a long time. How fabulous. Yeah, I agree. Does she sound like a Texan to you? I don't know. I'm Southern. I can't hear. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, okay. Let's go ahead. Oh, crap. Hey, Renee. Hey, Crips. I get to see you soon, right? I was thinking of you tonight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We hey, Matthias. So did I hear something about the volume being off? No, it wasn't off. It was low. It's fixed. Okay, okay, so I'll I'll be quiet so we can go. All right, very good. Wait a minute, what are we on? First Corinthians, what? Uh, 10 verse uh, 14, but we're going to start with 13. Okay, uh, but before we get started, let me ask, uh, as usual, uh, just to say hi. Sister Renee, I'll, you're see, you're in Eager Beaver, so say hi to everybody. Are, are we live now? Yes, we are. Oh my goodness, we, I'm been, rattling we've on. We've been hey, you guys. Long. It's Renee Rowland, channel of the same name. Uh, I'm affectionately called the Untwisted Sister because I uh, like to untwist scriptures that people twist up to say that our righteousness, some kind of works, are required to either get, maintain, or keep, uh, or even prove our salvation, which eternal life is a free gift. It's all about what Jesus did. You either trust him to save you or you do not. It is that simple. Great to be here with you guys tonight. Amen. We're thankful for our untwisted sister. If you are having any problems with some of the verses in the Bible that are um, um, making you wonder if faith alone in Christ alone is enough, then please go to her channel, Renee Rowland, and uh, she's helping us all to understand all those problem verses. Uh, and we have Brother Cripps with us. Want to say hi? Sure. Hello, everyone. I'm glad to be here tonight. I'm excited about the broadcast. And hello as well to the Albrights and everyone in the chat. And of course, Renee, hello to you. Let's mm -hmm. get started. Yeah. Well, Brother Cripps, I will tell you that we did miss your Sunday program. Uh, it's the first time you haven't had the Sunday program for I don't know how long, but I'll, I'm, we're going to be back. You're going to be back in operation next Sunday, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, we're going to be back in operations. Just uh, we're making some changes and going through some uh, personal stuff, and um, everything's fine. Uh, just uh, we're doing some retooling and stuff, but we will be back next uh, yeah. Sunday for sure. All right, okay, thank you. And if someone here doesn't know me, I'm Brother Luke, uh, Sin City preacher. So welcome uh, uh, in the chat room. If you're new, uh, especially if you're here for the first time, a welcome to you. Uh, Moderators, please make sure you take some time to, to greet uh, any of the new people. And now we'll get started with our, our study. We're on 
1 Corinthians chapter 15. <clears throat> I'll read it first in the KJV, beginning with, I'll read the 13 and 14. Uh, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as in common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will, with the temptation also, make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. Let's start with Sister Renee. Yeah, we were talking last week, and as you guys know, I try to uh, look at every verse that's commonly used and always really uh, check the context there. And, you know, we made a discussion, and I thought maybe this is talking about a specific temptation of the temptation to question God, and we discussed it. And I think Luke and Crypt are both right. I think this really is a general statement of temptation in general, uh, of it just being a general sin, and specifically marking uh, possible unbelief, but specifically marking fornication and idolatry. Idolatry is the big one. Uh, and we see we've discussed eating meat offered to idols and how it's not, you know, what you eat if you if everything's done in Thanksgiving. But some that are weak in the faith may feel that it's condemning to them so that, you know, uh, we adjust to where, where they are and meet them where they are. So I, I agree with um, uh, the brethren that this is exactly, you know, it's take it at face value. Um, so. No, I, I think he's saying that, you know, with the power of the Holy Spirit, God will give us the strength uh, to serve him, to uh, walk in his ways if we choose. And that's saying we're going to be sinlessly perfect in this fallen flesh, but that he will give us the strength and specifically here uh, to remain faithful to him, to not fall into idolatry. And as Brother Cripps was mentioning, that's not just uh, literal idolatry that he's referring to uh, uh, where they had literal temples and idols and so forth but the idolatry of placing something uh, in front of, of Christ uh, putting something uh, that you trust in or have more care for than Jesus himself and we all we are all guilty of doing that sometimes mm -hmm. all right thank you sister uh, uh, I, Brother Cripps, I'll read it next in the Amplified, and it sounds much like what Renee just said. <laughs> verse, four, um, verse 14 in the Amplified is, Therefore, my dearly beloved, shun, that is, keep clear away from, avoid by flight if need be, any sort of idolatry uh, of loving or venerating anything more than God. Yeah, they, they even use the word anything or anything. They make the point to say that. So at least they amplified it. Uh, they're expanding that out. Um, and we talked a little bit about it this week. And actually, I have thought about this uh, over the past week. I uh, thought about this verse because this, this verse has helped me throughout my life, especially later in life as I matured uh, more. And I thought about it. And I mentioned this last week, but it bears repeating when I, when I would think about uh, different different times in my life when I made poor choices or or I uh, acted in a rebellious or sinful way, and I thought, what would have been different in my life had I not done that? Especially the big ones, the big decisions that I made uh, that I can look back on and think, well, that that was a turning point in my life. But even some of the negative things, the decisions I made and the sins that I committed, uh, God used them for good, for my growth and for my learning, and uh, he kept me safe. And even though it was uh, hard to do, uh, he always grew me and changed me as a result. So I, I, I don't have regret. I don't walk around every day with regret for the things that I've done. Uh, but it's helpful in thinking uh, back to all those times and also thinking about the future, that there's nothing that God's going to allow me to uh, a situation that he's gonna allow me to get into where there's not some way out for me that I can avoid uh, slipping into uh, the, the temptation. And 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 the, the temptation itself is not sin. We're all tempted. We all have thoughts run through our mind. Uh, no matter how holy we think we are, we still have that flesh that we're carrying around with us. So we 
and maybe it's just me. I, I don't think it is, but I'll just speak for myself. I have thoughts run through my mind. Now, that the temptation or the thought running through your mind isn't the sin. It's when you act on it and you you uh, uh, focus on it and you make it a sin. There's no sin that's ever been committed that didn't start with a thought first. Uh, and people say, well, what about instantaneous, you know, where you just decide all of a sudden to rob a bank? Uh, you know, a, a crime of opportunity, I think they call it, or a sin of opportunity. Um, yeah, I, I think that even in that case, you still have to think about it first. You're, there's still a thought process, even if it's only for a few seconds, it's still a thought process, it's not your body just working out of concert with your, your mind. Um, but uh, anyway, thought about this verse uh, throughout the week, and I think that we, we have it. Uh, correct that uh, what it's saying and what Renee said face value um, it does mention adultery here and as as Renee was pointing out again uh, that doesn't mean just worshiping a, 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 a some kind of idol that we fashion out of gold and silver and propped up so it can be in our house not just not just that um, it, it can be anything it could be anything that we put in our life uh, that that we're holding above God. And I, for one, feel uncomfortable anytime I head in that direction. And that's because the Holy Spirit is in me and uh, he doesn't want us to do that. And I don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit and I don't want to, uh, I, I want to keep him first. Uh, so this is a great verse. Um, and it, it's always been that way to me. And I, I just love that you can read a verse that, you, that you've uh, read before many times and just have a, have a different result uh, at a different time in your life. It's the living word of God, and that just always amazes me. Mm -hmm. Okay, amen. Thank you, brother. Um, I, I want to uh, talk about, uh, in the chat room, we have um, Church for the Truth. Um, I don't recognize that name, so if you're here for the first time, uh, welcome. And if, if you've been here before, I apologize for not recognizing you earlier. But I do want to talk about your comment. It says, I believe this is why it says, hate your family in comparison to our love for God. We tend to idolize our spouses or children. Um, I haven't ever thought about that. Maybe I've never like idolized my spouse or children like that. I mean, I love them um, more than anything oh, there there's a there's an acronym that i had a shirt made once and it said joy j-o-y and the acronym means jesus others yourself and the point was the, the the priority of our life should be jesus is first other people come next and then yourself last of course it's not easy to live by that that would that would be the ideal but um uh, I've never placed my family in, in, in a place of uh, like an idol the way that you're saying there, uh, Church for the Truth. But uh, I'd like to get Renee and, and uh, Cripps' thoughts on that. But first, uh, the, uh, we did talk about verse 13 last Wednesday, so didn't want to rehash all of 13 again. But verse 14, um, it, it, you know, Paul says, therefore, of course, when he says, therefore, he, he's come bringing a conclusion. This is the conclusion of the first 13 verses. That's the point. He says, after we, okay, after you've listened to these first 13 verses, this is my conclusion. Dearly beloved, shun, keep clear away from, a, a, that is avoid by flight if you need be, any sort of idolatry, and that is uh, loving, venerating anything more than God. And it reminds me, of course, Jesus said, he's condensing all the, the law into love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Um, and people think, well, that's good. It's nice to have it reduced. That makes it real easy. But is it really easy? Is it really possible? And does anybody here now, anybody listening, can you claim that you actually have done that? Did you actually make love God with our, all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Do you actually love your neighbor as yourself? Maybe some people might claim that, but I don't think any of us have ever loved God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. I admit I fall short, and um, but I know the more I'm able to focus on Jesus and, and have God first, uh, the happier I am. 
Um, so uh, Renee and Cripps, let me get your thoughts on uh, uh, the comment in the chat room I read and also in the emails. Can I say something about that? Yeah, please. Do you mind, Cripps? No, no. Uh, this is something that uh, is common. This particular verse and these uh, surrounding verses are always pulled out of their contextual place. Jesus is speaking to very specific disciples about a very specific purpose. They were going to be the foundation of the church with him. He is it. Jesus is it. But I'm talking about they were going to be the ones that were going to have to get this message out. They were going out to preach. So he did not need half-hearted people in the beginning of his ministry. So what he's saying here, he's not telling believers that they have to hate their mother and father to be saved or that they're putting their family above uh, of, uh, God. And so therefore they're idols. God, God says, who doesn't, who doesn't take care of his family is worse than a heathen. Yep. So God is all for a uh, family. So this is not saying that what Jesus is talking about is a very specific situation. Uh, this was the first century, the beginning of the gospel. Uh, at first, he's trying to get the, uh, the Jews to receive him as the promised savior. And he knew they would reject him. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Uh, he was fine. As soon as I go on live, uh, he wants to act up. So <clears throat> he is telling the disciples, hey, you may end up not just giving up your family because you're going to be traveling. You might die. You might even lose your life. And if you're not willing to do it, see, you're going to be greatly rewarded in heaven. They are going to have their names written on the foundation of the new Jerusalem. They are going to rule over the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, so what, what he needed to let them know is that your reward is going to be tremendous, greater than, you know, most. Uh, and so if you're not willing to hate, and hate doesn't mean hate like the spies, but to be less prefer, less pre preferring, preferring them less than preferring God. So the focus is, is, is not on them is all it means that your focus isn't on the family. And so if you're not willing to give up all your, you know, all your belongings, your career, your family, and even possibly your life, then you're not worthy to be my disciple. You're not worthy of this that I'm offering. It's going to, it could cost you so much. So I really want to put that in its context that this is a very specific situation. It's not even talking about discipleship in general. It's talking about very specific disciples with a very specific mission. Uh, because this, like to be a disciple in America, it doesn't always cost you these things. Uh, you know, you can be a disciple uh, in today and not lose your life, for instance, you know. So I really want people to understand that this what Jesus is saying here is a very specific situation. And I see these things. Not, this person didn't do it. But John MacArthur and many others, they take these qualifiers for these specific disciples at this specific task, at this specific point in history and makes it a salvation issue and or a modern day issue with private interpretation. They just put private interpretation on it. So I wanted to clarify that situation. Hmm. Was there anything I missed? Did you have something else I was supposed to address or just that? Well, the, the comment in the chat room, but first let me say, is, is, that was excellent point. Uh, I noticed you always want to give us context. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, <laughs> isn't that amazing? Uh, what look what happens if you actually look at the scriptures in the context? Yeah, what was the intention of the writer at the time? Yeah. And um, I will say that regarding the idea of uh, hating, um, loving and hating, the, the way Jesus expressed that, we also have that. Uh, Paul, Paul writes that or quotes that uh, in Romans 9, referencing back to the uh, uh, the scriptures where God uh, loved uh, Jacob but hated uh, Esau. Amen, Brother Luke. They twist that one too. They mm -hmm. do. Yeah. So uh, if you go back to the, our study that we did on Romans and chapter 9, you'll see uh, I spent a lot of time uh, on that, uh, elaborating even further on those points the way that Rene did, that this is a relative thing. God didn't actually hate. It's just that his his affection for one was different than the other, and it was the way of showing the contrast. Um, but uh, uh, Cripps, let me see if you want to say more on this, and then I'll ask you both if you want to comment on the, chat, the comment in the chat room that I quoted here from Church for the for the truth uh yeah i think i think renee put it put it nicely uh in, in oh yeah yeah uh, i'm sorry renee did comment on that uh Chris, do you want to say anything about that yeah i, I was just going to say that I, th I think she did a good job of explaining it and i would completely agree with her uh and everything that she said regarding the comment and the verses um basically the only point i wanted to add you know the it says uh in the idea of hating um, again, specifically, that was for a particular group of people, and it wasn't the, the hating like, oh, you've got to despise them and, and, and not think about them and love them. Um, and if you, if you factor it into the verses, Jesus said unto them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So, who is your neighbor? I think that uh, that question has been answered with the story of the Good Samaritan. Uh, who's your neighbor? Everyone is your neighbor. And who's more your neighbor than your own family? Woo, there you go, Jason. Woo! So it's, it's laid out right there in Scripture. So, yes, people do take it out of context because they're trying to squeeze it into this idea that you give up, that serving God costs you something. And in this context, it costs you the love of your family. And then they use other verses. Well, Jesus came and brought a sword to divide families from each other and stuff. That's uh, not what, that's not what it refers to. It, it's it's not about that we're, our families are going to hate us and we have to d despise them in order to follow Christ. Why would he say that if in the same verse about loving him is also loving your neighbor? And your family's your neighbor. A lot of times you live with your family. It, it, it's not an excuse to, to neglect or to leave your family. And again, as Renee pointed out, um, made, made it very clear the verses about uh, the, what what Jesus thought of people that didn't take care of their family. No, and some of this should just be common sense, guys, honestly. But uh, sense is becoming less and less common as time goes on, unfortunately. Brother Luke, uh, yeah. KG responded about that context comment, and I it said, you know, some people say it, that the Bible, uh, it's important, that's why I'm going to mention it here. He said, Many people say scriptures were meant for God's word as God breathed. The entire word is given by the Holy Spirit. It's alive and will come out to speak whoever it will. Amen, it will. But if you don't read things contextually to whom they're written, uh, what was going on at that time, and, and it's not open to private interpretation. When you give private interpretation, you end up with false doctrine and false teaching. However, when you read scripture, it can speak to you in a very personal way, and it can speak to you in a way that may be different than what the original context was. I'm not saying that's not possible, but when it comes to understanding scripture, if we don't read it the way the author meant it to be understood, then we lose out. So that's all we're saying about context. We're not saying it can't speak to people. Of course it can. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, I've had uh, times where I've had um, a couple of uh, brethren uh, give me their thoughts on a verse, and they're completely different, and each one claims that they were given this understanding by the Holy Spirit directly. And obviously, if their interpretations are different, 
then it couldn't possibly be true that the Holy Spirit That's it. directed them both. That's it. Uh, I always caution everybody before you start uh, saying to me uh, something uh, uh, that is your understanding about the scripture. Do not say, thus saith the Lord, based on your interpretation, uh, because it was revealed to you. Give it to us as something to consider. But if you start teaching it as this is this is the word of God, God revealed it to me. That's the problem. Uh, we need to, uh, we know the context is the, um, the foundation of understanding the scriptures. You've got the context of the verses before and after. You've got the context of the, the chapter and the, the, the book itself. Uh, this is the first Corinthians. We talked about on the introduction to this book, the uh, who wrote it, when it was written, who it was written to, what was the main issues that were being discussed. That's the context. And then the context of one book in the Bible, you have to keep it in context with the rest of the Bible. So all these things are essential, but if you start uh, doing private interpretations, and I see a lot of people doing that, um, then uh, you're, uh, you're, uh, uh, we, we believe in freedom and liberty uh, we, uh, for your doctrinal positions, but that's taking it too far. Uh, you've got to understand what was the intention of the original writer at the time. That, that trumps any other interpretations. Um, that is, that is I, such an excellent point. Yeah, I, I want to say, Brother Cripps, that even when you said that your family is also your neighbor, uh, again, I'm, I've never thought of it that way, uh, but that's what an important point for us to understand. I've seen people be so kind to their neighbors, but their family, the way they treat their own family is with such disrespect, and, and yet they would never... They would never treat the, the you know the the rest of the people like that for somehow their their uh, bad behavior and and a bad attitude it seems to be reserved for their own families. Yeah, and it's unfortunate. But uh, when Jesus says your neighbor, love your neighbor, he doesn't mean the people that have the house next door to you. No. It really means broadly, in the broad sense, all of humanity, all people. Some neighbors are closer than others. Uh, your family's the closest if they live under your roof, and then your next door neighbors, and then the neighbors, in, in, as it ex you expand it geographically to the whole world, it really becomes your neighbor. Yeah. All right. Uh, before we go on to the next verse, I wanted to look at the footnote in the NABRE. It says, uh, for verse 14 to 22, this is a, uh, so this will jump ahead, giving us a footnote uh, on that whole portion. It says, <clears throat> uh, the warning against idolatry from 1 Corinthians 10, 7 is now repeated in 1 Corinthians 10, 14 and explained in terms of the e effect of sacrifices. That, that is, all sacrifices, um, uh, Christian, Jewish, pagan, established communion, but communion with Christ is exclusive and incompatible with any other such communion. Compare the line of reasoning at 1 Corinthians 6.15. Uh, all right, we're not going to go back to that, but okay, those are the footnights. Uh, okay, any, any more before we go to the next verse, Renee or Cripps? Yeah, I don't want to drag it out too long, but I've, after what you said, which I agree with completely, I just wanted to point out that so many, it's so prevalent these days to have, have someone come up to you or have a conversation with you and they pass this information and they say the words, God told me this or God showed me this. And they say it from, uh, from a place of authority as if what they're, the, the, the information they're imparting to you is straight from the Lord. Um, I think that's extremely dangerous. And I, and just, thank you. Just because we're in New Testament times and God isn't striking people dead or having them, uh, what was the penalty if you caught someone, if someone was found to be a false prophet back in the day? Does anyone death, know? Death, death, death. So all these people are not fearing the Lord when they're, when they're passing along things and saying, uh, yeah, the Lord revealed this to me. You know, you need to do this and you need to do that especially if it goes against scripture. I, I hear so many people that are, especially prophetic stuff, that they're saying, God gave me this dream. And, you know, he said, he said to me these things that don't even line up with, 
what what we do understand, I understand uh, prophetic things are are hard to pin down, uh, but there are some things that we're pretty clear on. So it goes against scripture, and they're they're saying that God gave them some divine revelation, a singular revelation to them only that goes against scripture. The minute it goes against scripture, you know that you're dealing with a false prophet, pure and simple. But it's so prevalent. I'm so tired of hearing it. And it's really prevalent on YouTube. You know, people saying the word of the Lord yep. for this, this month. Word, the word from the Lord this month. And they do it every month. And you listen to the these words that they're saying. And a lot of them have to do with prosperity. And this is going to be your month. You know, I, God told me that he's just going to yeah, create all this stuff for you. And you're going to find that job, that promotion that you've been waiting for. This, this time it's going to come through and all that stuff. And they're building a false hope based on their understanding of their prosperity doctrine. And they're building a false un false uh, narrative for people to cling to in a broken and fallen world. You should be just clinging to what the Bible says. You don't have to listen to some personal uh, word from someone that says they got some revelation from God. If God wants you to know something, he's going to reveal it to you, especially oh. searching his word. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank Amen. you, Jason. Amen. Good, great. They speak out of the deceit of their own heart, saying, yep. I have dreamed, I have dreamed. And he said, I have not sent them. Yep. Well, uh, we've spent 30 minutes just on one verse, so I guess we should move on. <laughs> That's good stuff, though. <laughs> okay. okay. I thought Jason said, I thought he was going to say, I do want to drag it out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's go back to the KJV, verse 15, and this is for Brother Cripps. I speak as to wise men, judge ye what I say. Wow, that's telling, isn't it? So this is not Paul assuming here. He's he's saying to them, you guys should know this. I, I speak to you as if you're wise men. So he's giving them benefit of the doubt to understand what he's saying. So he's saying, "Judge you judge what I say. This should make sense to you guys, what I'm saying. It should be clear to you. And uh, I, I think it is clear. I think what he's saying is clear. I think that the interpretations that we've all discussed and what the way they amplified and said it, I think I think some of these things should should be just glaringly obvious. I don't know if I said that phrase right. Glaringly, glaringly obvious. That doesn't sound right. It should be obvious to us is the point. All right. Thank you. Uh, Sister Renee, I'll, I'll read it in the Amplified before you comment. It says, I am speaking as to intelligent, sensible men. Think over and make up your minds for yourselves about what I say. I appeal to your reason and your discernment in these matters. Mm -hmm. discernment. Yeah, Crips, man, he nailed it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he got it. it, it he's actually... Uh, uh, Paul is just saying you have the discernment, you have the ability to know. You guys have heard me many times on my channel say, "Don't blind me. Trust me. Don't trust me blindly. Don't trust any person blindly. Trust Scripture, but not only Scripture. Go to God. the The Spirit of Truth dwells within you. Yeah. Read the Scripture. Let Spirit go to God and ask." him to show you given so when you reason with god that way mm -hmm. when he will give you because it says that the spiritual man is the only one that can discern the things of god mm. that's why the natural man he's at enmity the gospel is at enmity with the natural man that's the lost carnal man the man that's only in the flesh that doesn't have the spirit they are foolishness to him he is not subject to the laws of god neither indeed can be but he has no understanding. That's why they're always adding to the gospel or saying your works keep you safe or something else. You got to do this or that to keep it, you know, to get it, to prove you're saved or whatever, because it's, it's foolishness to uh, the unsaved person. And so he's saying, you guys are saved. You have the spirit. Use not only your man's reason, but let let the spirit show you. You are wise in these things because you have the spirit of truth in you. And I think that's what he's implying, like Brother Cripps was saying. Amen. Yeah. Well, I I'm flashing back to uh, the beginning of this book, uh, 
uh, first chapter, I, I remember Paul was saying that, um, I'm paraphrasing, but I can't believe I have to come and tell you these things. You should know these things. Don't you even know that you're going to judge angels someday? Mm -hmm. So um, Paul was expecting that uh, we, we should be able to have this discernment and, and uh, understand and, and uh, make these judgments and, uh, and apply them. Uh, okay, let's go to the next verse here in the, in the KJV. And it says, uh, verse 16, the cup of blessing which we bless it, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Sister Renee? Yeah, I want to actually, hold on, I'm going over to this so I can look at it word for word. I'm going uh, to read, I'm gonna read no, I, let me read verse 17. They're, they're really connected. No, go right ahead. Okay. Uh, for we being many are one bread in one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. Mm. Yeah, I, he's, he's uh, the cup of the blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? He's saying we're all one. He's, he's pulling that uh, together that we are, we are all one. Uh, uh, and he is one and we are one with him. I, I, that's basically what he's saying, mm -hmm. I believe. All right, so uh, it's let, me, let me read it for you in the uh, Amplified verse uh, 16 and 17. <clears throat> the cup of blessing of wine at the Lord's Supper upon which we ask God's blessing, does it not mean that in drinking it, we participate in and share a fellowship that is a communion in the blood of Christ, the Messiah. The bread which we break, does it not mean that in eating it, we participate in and share a fellowship, a communion in the body of Christ? For we, no matter how numerous we are, are one body, because we all partake of the one bread that is the one whom the communion bread represents. Wow, if, if nothing else, this shows us how far we've seemed to come from when, when Paul was around, when he said these words. I mean, if, if you just, if you look at all the denominations and the different, the different Jesuses, you know, Matthias talks about this all the time, all the different Jesuses that are out there. And uh, the, they're, they're following different Jesus, and it's not the same communion. It doesn't seem like. It doesn't seem like it's the same belief system. That it seems like people, people believe different things. Um, but what he's saying here is absolutely right. We are one body. Uh, the communion is, we're, we're, you know, this do in remembrance of me. You're having communion. It's Christ's uh, blood and, and his body that we're breaking in remembrance of the bread and the wine. Um, so it, it should be uniting us. It should be putting us in, into one body and one mind. We've discussed this before and how far we've gotten from that. It, it's really, it's really sad and it's frustrating. Um, wouldn't it be great if we didn't have to, I mean, we could still do these broadcasts, but it wouldn't be a lot of time spent, uh, uh, untwisting scripture from other people's interpretations and trying to put it back into the right place. Um, as you said, Brother Luke, at the, it, it does remind it at the beginning when he's he's saying, you know, and how often does Paul say this? I can't believe that I'm paraphrasing. This is the Paul paraphrase. Can't believe that I have to come and tell you this again. Haven't I preached this to you before? Didn't you get it the first time? You know, things like uh, unless you've left what we taught you before, unless the, unless you've totally been removed from the things that that you once believed, then here's here's what you need to do. Um. So uh, Paul spends a lot of time, even back then, and I've said this before, because people didn't get it, and they still don't get it. We are, we're supposed to be one mind. All believers are supposed to be one body, one mind. We should all be. Um, we should all be on the same page. Now, I do believe that in the end times, God will put us all on the same page. I believe that every believer that's on the face of the earth at that time, in the end times, 
we'll all be of one mind. We'll all be as it's intended to be as we prepare for uh, Christ, uh, uh, the last things that need to be done before we're in eternity with him uh, for all time. Well, outside of time. I, I caught it, Matthias. He was going to correct me. <laughs> Thanks. All right. <laughs> well, you're right. Paul Paul's rhetorical style of writing. We we've, we've talked a lot about it, and uh, uh, he he asks a lot of questions that are rhetorical. He, yeah. is, he doesn't expect an answer. He's just like what, you know. Uh, in Galatians. You mean he's not really asking if he can send to grace abounds? <laughs> no. Right. But I, I can picture Paul as being like so frustrated with these churches. They're going they're going off on being misled by the Judaizers. Uh, they're um, becoming apostate. Uh, they're foolish Galatians. And, and uh, he's just kind of Imagine how frustrated he, he was then. We're frustrated dealing with all these same things today, all the time. But uh, I, I don't know. I feel for him. I'm, I feel like we are all uh, going through the same kind of problems uh, in, in church today that Paul had to deal with. It, has, it never goes away. Nope. It's uh, all the problems that we see in the church now. Um, are all documented in the epistles in the first century. These all these problems existed. They've never completely gone away. We're still dealing with the same arguments and getting the same accusations against us for teaching what Paul taught. And, and uh, you know they accused him of being a false apostle. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, we certainly they're still teaching today. Many people that Paul was a false apostle. And of course, since we are supporting Paul's do doctrines, that you know we're accused of that also. Mm -hmm. uh, it is, it is amazing. I, I can't wait to meet Paul someday. I hope I can, he has some time for me. Uh, all right, let's go back to the KJV verse. Uh, Might have to wait in line, brother Luke. <laughs> <laughs> where yeah. where God, Jesus, you know, he's he could be in several different places at once, right? Yeah. Uh, Paul probably isn't. <laughs> yeah, we're Paul and the rest of us. We're not going to have that kind of ability to be omnipresent. No. Uh, but uh, yeah, isn't it nice to think that Jesus could be spending time with everybody, everybody individually and collectively at the same time? Well, that's the, the ask Matthias about that. Matthias right, he's doing that right now. I think <laughs> that's yeah. what I believe. Paradise is. I believe when he said to the thief on the cross, "Today you will be with me in paradise." That doesn't mean that um, he was going to the belly of the earth. It's that Jesus, I think even for Old Testament saints, the moment they were out of the flesh, they were present with the Lord. And that, you know, that their time waiting for the resurrection is one on one and face to face with Jesus Christ. So um, I, I think that's the case. Uh, I don't know, but I, I would. Um, I do think that his omniscience and omnipresence makes it possible to where he can have a genuine fellowship with each and every person at the exact same time and it be a 100% one-on-one -on -one us with God. Um, and he'd be giving us 100% of his total affection, attention, emotion, while he's given 100% of himself to everybody else as well. It's just awesome thinking about how grand our God is. Mm, amen. Yeah, well, thankfully, Jesus can do that. Uh, but uh, Paul, I don't think he's going to have that kind of ability. No. So no. we're going to have to all just take a number. There'll be a long line to, to spend some time with Paul, I think. Um, all right. Let's go back to the KJV, uh, look at verse 18. <clears throat> Behold, Israel after the flesh, are not they which eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? What say I then, that the idol is anything, or that which offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? So I read 18 and 19 together, Brother Cripps. 
Uh, yeah, behold Israel, after the flash, or eat the sacrifice, partakers of the altar. What shall I say then, that the idol is anything, or that uh, that which is offered in sacrifice idols is anything? Um, without reading further and seeing where he's going, I would say that he, he said this before. Again, we're back to the, the same thing. Uh, behold Israel after the flesh. I think I would benefit from hearing the Amplified Version, Brother Luke, if you don't mind reading that. Okay, I'll read that. 18 and 19, the Amplified says, um, Consider those uh, physically, uh, the people of Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices partners of the altar? That is, they're united in their worship of the same God? What do I imply then? That food offered to idols is intrinsically changed by the fact and amounts to anything, or that an idol itself is a living thing? Yeah, that follows up with what, I, what I'm what i thinking is that he's referring back to the same point that he's made before about food sacrificed to idols. And uh, the verses above, he's talking about communion and saying that aren't, aren't we all partaking in the same bread, which is you know, the bread of life, and aren't we all of one body? And then he, he doubles down and makes this point again uh, about the food offered to idols and saying that it's not a living thing. Is he making the point here uh, in opposition to what the Catholics believe about the communion? Uh, they think that when you take communion, it is literally his blood and his, uh, I forget the word for it. There is a word for it. Uh, Transubstantiation. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so is he is he fighting that before it even exists? I, I don't know, but um, he's definitely made the point before about the food offered to idols that we don't have to worry about that. There's nothing in and of itself about the food. Um, it, you know, it, it, it matters what it means to the person who's eating it. If it's sin to you, then don't do it. And if you, you have a problem with it, don't do it. But if you, if, if you have liberty, if you have freedom, okay. it's okay. Well, in, in the amplified, it seems to be uh, um, stating that. Uh, I'll read that again in 19. What do I imply then? That food offered to idols is intrinsically changed by the fact and amounts to uh, anything or that an idol itself is a living thing. Now, he's, he's re referencing uh, things sacrificed to idols there, not uh, not the communion wafer or the Eucharist, as they call it. But, um, I, but then he answers in the next verse, no. But go on, let me get Renee's thoughts on 18 and 19 first. Yeah, well, there's, you know, there's other places where Paul is clearly saying, hey, what's an idol? You can eat meat offered to idols. It's nothing. An idol is nothing. But here is where I, I tr I've shown this to people on a couple of places that, that just because the idol is nothing and if you're in Christ and you're secure, it really doesn't matter. But he is making a, a, a truth here that needs to be understood. There are evil spirits that are behind these idols and you are fellowshipping with evil spirits when you do uh, um, meat offered to idols and go to their temples and, and take part in their sacrifices. Uh, even though the idol itself is nothing, it can't hear, it can't see, it can't speak. There is an evil spirit behind these idols and they were, they were housed in giant temples and then you would buy the little idols to take home with you to offer sacrifices there for your house. So in one aspect, the idol's nothing. And if you're secure in Christ, it's okay as long as you're not condemned. But uh, here he's talking more about um, that as opposed to, um, he's talking about the spiritual aspect of communion and what that would look like to commune with the devil. So our the, the body and blood is represented in the wine and the bread and we are communing with the Lord, with God himself through partaking in it. It is a very sacred event. And he's making a statement of that. And then he's showing you the opposite of that, which means that if you commune, because uh, the issue here isn't, is it okay to eat meat offered to idols or not? That's not the issue in this one. When he addressed that, he said, hey, what's an idol? It's nothing. You can eat it. And if you Thanksgiving, you're fine. 
But this is the spiritual aspect of communing. And he's saying, if you eat their food and do the rituals with them, you are communing with devils. Uh, so uh, he is letting people know, uh, behold, Israel, how far did you go on that? Um, because I don't want to go too far. I think I already did. I think I already did. But uh, I had to say it or it won't make sense what I was trying to say. So if you if you want to uh, skip me on that one because I already did it, uh, I, I, I didn't know any other way to make my point without going a step further. So I apologize for going to 20, but that's what I felt he was doing. He was going about the spiritual aspect of how we commune with the Lord through the Lord's Supper. And that if you do if you do these rituals, you're actually communing with devils. And so I think he's just showing the spiritual aspect of it and how sacred it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, well, let's look at 20 in the KJV first. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. And in the uh, Amplified, it, it actually, he they answer the question uh, see paul says in 19 what do i imply then and he says uh, and he ends up um, th that food offered to idols is intrinsically changed by the fact and amounts to anything or that an idol itself is a living thing questions so he's asking questions here and in the amplified it clearly just says the answer is no no i am suggesting that what the pagan sacrifice they offer in effect to demons, to evil spiritual powers, and not to God at all. I do not want you to fellowship and be partners with diabolical spirits by eating at their feasts. Yeah, I think that's pretty clear. Don't eat at their feasts. You know, um, we we have communion, and that should be enough. Uh, we don't need to partake in their feasts. Now, of course, someone's going to hear that and say, "Well, you know, that means we can't eat, uh, you know, in, in, you know, unless it's uh, some kind of spiritual meal with uh, church folks. So we're we're not to eat, um, we're not to celebrate anything, you know, uh, the people that are against uh, Christmas and things like that, and they have a heyday with that sort of thing. Like uh, we're we're uh, disobeying God if we um, have Christmas dinner or something." Um, it's not saying that at all. Uh, I think it's specifically uh, people in the church at that time that were believers that were also taking part in some of these, uh, the old um, uh, feasts that they used to be a part of because it was still popular to do that in the towns in which they lived, that stuff was still going on. Um, that's what it seems to be to me. Uh, but maybe either of you two would know more than me about that. It just seems like He's uh, bringing this up uh, a, a lot toward those the the people in that particular church, in the Corinthian church. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we have to reflect back again to the beginning of the study <clears throat> when we did the introduction to this book. We talked about uh, Paul was answering uh, uh, a letter from uh, Chloe. Uh, was it Chloe or Phoebe? It was Chloe. Uh, and Chloe said, "There's." these problems in the church you need to uh you need to deal with this and he basically said there's five problems that he's addressing in the letter but the the context of the whole thing was that corinth at that time uh in history was a place that was like um it was kind of like a las vegas or a san francisco of the time and and they had people from all over and all kinds of uh, uh philosophers and they really valued and admired a philosopher they advise they they really were inter interested in all kinds of religious thought and they had all kinds of temples and different kinds of worshiping going on and uh, so uh what you had was the faith the christian faith was being polluted and influenced by all these other things these philosophies and pagan religions so they were actually participating in these pagan feasts that's why i have to say yeah i want you to do that yeah. Uh, but it is true that some people today would try to apply these verses to saying that uh, uh, if you're 
uh, let's say you're participating in Halloween or, or Christmas or Easter, uh, these things are not really should not be practiced by Christians, and that uh, that that's they would cite this kind of verse here to support it. I think. Uh, any more on that, Renee or Krebs, before we move on? Christmas is coming. <laughs> yeah. Oh, by the way, I, I've been wanting to say this. Oh, gosh. We got an hour, and I've thought, thought of this like four or five times now. It's so late, I, it's pointless now. Not really, but I notice in the chat room that sometimes people are making comments, or maybe if you have a question, and you're not putting it in all caps. Uh, so uh, in the, the chat room, if, if you do want to make a comment that you would like us to respond to, or if you have a question you want us to answer, type in all caps. Otherwise, I'm not going to be able to, it won't stand out and I won't be able to identify it. So do that, please. <clears throat> all right, so let's go to uh, the next verse in the KJV is... Um, Verse 21, ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. Renee? Yeah, it's, it's obvious is what he's saying, that there's no middle ground here. You, you can't uh, fellowship, commune, take the Lord's body and celebrate his body and blood and then go celebrate uh, some devil that's been sacrificed to. It's just, you can't do it. It's not possible. And and so he's uh, uh, telling them to abstain from that because it does have spiritual significance they need to recognize. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, you know, Paul, uh, throughout this letter, and, and I believe I remember in Romans also, uh, he repeats over and over again that all this liberty that we have, uh, even, even earlier in this very chapter here, he's talking about the liberty that we have. And is this, could we, could we see that somehow these are not uh, compatible? These, the liberty to, to do one thing and then now he's saying we, we are not to do this? What, what am I missing here? Oh, one one issue is uh, one guy go, before he's discussing, hey, is it OK if I go to someone's house and they've offered their household dinner to whatever uh, fake God they have at their house? Is it all right to eat there? Is it OK to eat it? Right. And Paul is saying, uh, well, yeah, of course, we don't want to offend them. We eventually want to get them saved. And what's an idol? They're nothing anyway. And if all things can be eaten with Thanksgiving. And so it, it doesn't, you know, but those weak in the faith might feel they have to abstain from it. So he's addressing that issue. That's a separate issue. And this issue is more about the spiritual, uh, 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 what's going on spiritually here. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I think that's what's going on because he's talking about how we're all one and the, we're communing with the Lord through uh, the bread and the wine. And then he's uh, showing the opposite of that, how the pagans are communing with devils and we can't commune with devils. So uh, there was one instance where I believe they're talking about going into someone's home and, and wanting to, you know, preach to them or be a guest in their home, but they are offering them to idols. Is it okay to eat in that house? I believe that's the situation there. Here, I think he's talking about people going out and partaking in these specific uh, rituals with pagans. Yeah. He's showing mm -hmm. the opposite of that. All right. Um, Preps, uh, I want to ask you if you uh, recognized my Pauline technique I just used. Uh, yeah. What do, what do they call that? The, um, Prosopopoeia? Yeah. Pro, there is that you go. what it is? Yeah. Well, I, it, it, I guess it would be more of a, um, a di diatribalism. As, there as what, you go. You got all the words. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, um, so prosopopoeia is when you're speaking for your opponent, you're giving your opponent's viewpoint. So it is prosopopoeia, but, uh, the, I, I said, I asked a question. I mean, I, 
I already had an answer in mind. It's not like I'm puzzled by it. And I don't think Paul is puzzled when he asks these quest questions. Uh, so he asked the question in the next, the very next verse, he says, no. So why is he asking the question? But it's a technique he's using, a, a form of communication that he, he uses throughout. And I thought I'd, I'd try that. Is it, or should, so my question was, he's telling us we have liberty and now he's saying you can't do this. Is this some kind of a, what's going on here? Is this some kind of a contradiction, Crips? It's not a contradiction. I, he's he's simply making the point, uh, and he's often sarcastic, and in some ways it may come across as being that way, but um, it's not a contradiction. He's he's saying you, you can't, uh, again, I go back up to where he's talking, he, he talked about communion for a reason, guys. He's mentioning communion, saying that, that well, don't we all take communion, just to make this point, which is to say you can't be taking communion and also be taking these other feasts to other gods, literal feasts. It's not referring to Christmas or Easter. Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's referring to the feasts that were done at that time that were in, in uh, Corinth, uh, where people were still having these feasts to these demonic spirits. They think they're gods, but they're not. Paul's making very clear what they are. They're evil spiritual powers they're they're higher powers in the spiritual realm they're demonic or or fallen fallen angels whatever you choose to believe um but it, it, it you can't do both is what he's saying so yeah that's a contradiction don't do both you know either you're doing one or the other you can't you you, you can't do both mm -hmm. all right thanks the uh uh the next verse in the um kjv Verse 22, do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than, than he? Again, do you think Paul doesn't know the answer to these questions, Sister Renee? Yeah, I like, <laughs> yeah, I like when he does that. Shall we sin? Shall we sin? So grace may abound. Um, let me, let me see how he does that. Hold on. Yeah, do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Yeah, do we really want to do this? Do you really want to uh, do this to where uh, the, you're going to anger the Lord because he's a jealous God? And are we, yeah, I mean, it's just ob obvious. What did you call it? The Is that is that prosopopoeia yeah, taking the opposite view and making it a question? Yeah, yeah. Or is this diatribal where you're right. going back and forth in a conversation? Yeah, the the terms are almost interchangeable, but the prosopopoeia is is what I use particularly. If you look at Romans chapter one and two, the study we did, we did a dramatic reading of that. Uh, Cripps played the uh, the uh, uh, the opponent of Paul, and and I I, I read this verses that Paul so awesome. sentiments, uh, and we read them uh, as a kind of an argument back and forth. And so prosopopoeia is just the technique of uh, you, 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 uh, you don't have an opponent for your debate. So what you do is you, you pretend you're the opponent and you speak for the opponent, expressing his point of view, and you present their, your point. So it's probably like a common response that he gets and he's going to say it before they, like almost like he knows what they're going to say. Mm -hmm. Almost like he is answering the question before they can ask it. Yeah, and, and, yeah, and sometimes, got it. sometimes it's like a rhetorical question is like, come on, I'm asking right. you a question, but why am I even have to answer this question? Right. So, Are you going to provoke the Lord to jealousy or stronger than he? Yeah, like it's it's uh, ridiculous because you already absurd, know the answer. It's absurd that. that I have to even bring this up. You should Right. I get it. I get it. Absolutely. So, uh, uh, let me read verse 22 in the uh, Amplified Crips. Uh, Shall we thus provoke the Lord to jealousy and anger and indignation? Are we stronger than he that we should defy him? Yeah, isn't it defying him to have have communion and, and to be worshiping the one and only God and then to go worship lesser demons? lesser gods, you know, little G. Yeah, I mean, to me, that would be provoking the Lord to jealousy, knowing that he's stated very, very clearly, hasn't he said, I'm a jealous God? 
he, he's he's made it clear this isn't something he's hiding that we don't know about. He's saying I'm the one and only God. And also, I may have said this before, but yes, that is for him. It's because he's a jealous God. But that's also for us because he doesn't want us to put all our time, effort, and attention into worshiping something else that isn't real. He doesn't want us worshiping other gods, not just for him, but because he knows that it'll be destructive for us. He he deserves all the glory. He does. But a lot of the a lot of the laws, if you look at each of the Ten Commandments and you look at the laws uh, that that pertain to us, it it is that they're not just uh, things that he's just saying arbitrarily. He knows us. He created us. He knows us inside and out, and he knows what things are good for us. He knows that he's the only God. So of course he doesn't want us to to get into situations where we're we're putting our trust in things in in, in idols or or other things that don't have any power, um, and setting up arbitrary uh, commandments for us that aren't for our own good. Um, I mean, I could go on, but I, I think that that makes the point. So, uh, yeah, I have no desire to provoke uh, the Lord to jealousy. I want Him to know that although I can never pay Him back for the the gifts that he's given to me out of his own grace and mercy. Um, I certainly don't want to provoke him to jealousy for sure. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, I'm real eager to get to this next verse 23 in the KJV. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Now, my question, first of all, uh, I think, Cripps, it's your turn to go first here. Um, this verse sounds very familiar to me. Uh, yeah. I, I look at the footnote in the NABRE, and it says, um, uh, let me see. Let me see what verse was it, 23? Um, It says, he repeats in the context of this new problem, the slogans of liberty from 1 Corinthians 6, 12, with similar qualifications. Now, if you remember back in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12, this very verse is there, and we discussed it. And I was blown away because somebody revealed to me, and in the footnotes of chapter 6, it was stated that this saying is not Paul's thoughts. This is the saying that was popular, that Paul was like, he's saying what people are saying. And then he's answering like, shall we, uh, shall we sin so that grace can abound? That's not Paul's sentiment. That, that, was the, that was the argument that was being made against Paul's teaching. And so Paul is saying it, but it's not Paul's thoughts, not Paul's sentiment at all. And, and, and this, this is true. I, I always thought, for 33 years, I thought all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. In other words, I've always loved this verse because it tells me that, okay, we have freedom. Yeah, We're freedom. We don't have to feel like we're under bondage and a legalistic system uh, working for our salvation. But if we do things that are not uh, the way God desires it, uh, breaking the laws, uh, that, that uh, it's not expedient. In other words, it's not beneficial. It's not going to be helpful. It's not good for us. We will have some consequences if we, uh, if we don't do what's good, what the right thing is. Even though God's not going to send anybody to hell over it, but we're still, uh, it's not wise to do it. It's not expedient. So I always thought, what a wonderful verse to make to prove our point. And yet, I find that this verse was not Paul's sentiment. Paul is, is responding to the, 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 this kind of the slogan that was being, being taught in the Corinthian church. Hey, everything's lawful. Okay, it might not be good for you, but don't worry. It's, it's lawful. Don't worry about it. You're not going to be in any trouble. So Paul is responding to this. Um, whose turn is to go? Renee? Sure. Renee, uh, 23. I'm sorry you broke up. My, it's my thing. You what want to go first? You just said all things. I love this verse. 
yeah, I, I'm like you. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are expedient. and all things are lawful for me, but all things that if I not. He uses that again in another place, doesn't he? All things are permissible, but not all things are expedient. All things are yeah. lawful, but I will not be brought under the power of any or something. Yeah, why don't you, uh, uh, Renee, since you missed the point I made, uh, you didn't hear it, let, let's let Crips go on. I, yeah, I'm breaking up, I'm telling you. I, yeah, I want to come back in. Can I try? Yeah, go ahead. Come back All in. All right, back thank there. you. Go ahead, Brother Crips. Respond to the verse in the context of, of, of my, my, my statement there. If you yeah, 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 absolutely. So all things are lawful for me, but all things are not uh, expedient. Um, he has said this before. He's saying that uh, even though we have uh, liberty, it's not necessarily right to to use that. And while you were talking, Brother Luke, I thought of an example. And maybe it's not a good one, but um, each of us that owns a car, we have the speedometer usually in most vehicles, unless it's some kind of Maserati or some sports car, but most uh, most vehicles that people can afford, uh, the speedometer goes up to 120 miles per hour, generally speaking. Um, so that's saying that, okay, if you were to go that fast, uh, the speedometer is capable of telling you how fast you're going up to 120 miles an hour. Um, but we know that if we were to drive 120 miles an hour in most places, unless you're in, you know, some part of Montana, where uh, it's a little bit more lenient or on the Autobahn in Germany where you, uh, there's no speed limit, um, you, there are gonna be consequences for that. And I'll also tie it into this idea that uh, we in the grace community are somehow saying that we have this license to sin. This is this is Paul putting this into perspective for it. Yes, yes, all things are lawful. We have, we, uh, we're not under the law uh we're able to have freedom in christ um but that doesn't give us it, we don't have the attitude that that means oh well, we're, we can just go on sinning we can go just do whatever we want he's saying that yes it's lawful but not everything is is uh makes good sense for you to participate in and he's doing this in reference to what he's just said which is don't eat off both tables don't don't eat off the demon's table and the table of the Lord. You can't do that. Um, don't provoke the Lord to jealousy. And then, you know, uh, finally this point, which is just saying, um, yeah, we have freedom, but let's use let's use the sense God gave us and uh, put this in the context that it deserves to be in. Of course, you can't uh, worship devils and eat the feasts of devils and also uh, eat the feasts of the Lord. Mm hmm. All right. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, I see Renee is back. Renee, are you able to hear and comment now? Yeah, see, I, I moved uh, servers. I've gone over to Internet Explorer. Usually Google is the best way to use Google Hangouts, but I can barely hear you guys are chopping in and out. And I can't know when you stop talking either. And I don't want to step over you. So let's see how this server works out. I'm surprised Google's not working. Can you okay. guys hear me OK? All right, let me re let me repeat the point that you missed. And get Can you hear on. me though? Yeah. Okay, Maybe everything's good. Clear. All right, you're loud, loud and clear. Okay. Okay. This verse, uh, everything is lawful, uh, and uh, not all things are expedient, was also back in First Corinthians chapter six, mm -hmm. and when we discussed it at that time, we saw in the footnotes and also someone in the chat room who uh, claimed that they uh, understood it, but I did. It was confirmed in the footnotes that. The, the thought is that um, this was not uh, tall Paul's teaching. All things are lawful to me, but all things are expedient. But this was something that was being promoted in the Corinthian church. And uh, even though we know that Paul will say, yeah, you, uh, that this is a valid principle, but I think that they were taking it too far and, and exploiting it and okay. flaunting this principle. And that's why Paul is saying, this is what's being said but I want to make sure you understand. Okay, so go ahead and comment it in that context, if you will. Yeah, okay. So uh, if, if that is the case, let me pull back down where I was here. Hold on. You all right? Yeah. I'll sit here. So if that, if that is the case, confirming. Let me see. We'll be finished up in 10 minutes. Hold on. Okay, here we go. 
Um, yeah, he's con if that's a context, he is confirming, yes, we are free. We are free. Uh, but uh, as before, it's our reasonable service uh, to do what's expected of a child of God mm -hmm. without being told. That's why it's ridiculous that he has to even say, do we provoke the Lord to know? Are we stronger than he? And then having to even tell them that we don't go sacrifice things to idols still. You know, you're not going, you don't do that. It's not, even though you're free, you're, you're not under the law uh, and you're not justified by the law, but it should, it, it's without, I shouldn't even have to tell you this. Um, and if this is the case, he's just confirming that it's not productive for you. It's, it doesn't lift you or others up. The whole point of everything a Christian does once they're saved is to be a good witness, give God's name glory through your actions. I mean, that's the whole point of us, one, to serve our father, to let him know we love him because he first loved us. And the only way we can do that is through our obedience and to love. And when you, you love, you don't go fellowship with devils because you love God. You're faithful to the one you love. So, um, yeah, he's confirming, yeah, you're free, but it's not, it's not edifying anybody. It's not lifting you up and it's not lifting up the church. It's not lifting up the brethren. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I, the next verse, uh, is he's, he's moving into a little different subject. So this is probably a good time to, to stop. And let's, so we can save uh, the last 10 minutes here to do our summary remarks here. And let's also look at the chat room. Oh, well, by the way, Hendrix. Are you going to stop there or do the next one? Because that we're actually gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna stop there because the next okay. one, next verse is changing direction. Oh, okay, gotcha. Okay, I want to look at Hendrix's comics here. Brother Hendrix wrote a uh, uh, very good verse, quote, not all things edify unquote some things don't build you up in the lord in fact some may be detrimental uh and then i do like to note that paul does agree with the fact that quote all things are lawful for me uh, that is allowed unquote so i think hendrix is concerned and, and we should all be uh, agree that this is a not a point that paul is disputing uh, I, I would not want to take it that way but I think that this particular uh, idea was something that was being promoted in the church and they were probably taking it too far. And that's why Paul is uh, quoting it twice, chapter six and again here, because he, he, this is a problem. Uh, it's, not, it's not a false uh, uh, principle, but it's a problem if you're, if you're uh, uh, what is it when you take advantage of something? Uh, it, you're taking, a, there's a word for that. But, um, okay, so that's it. Uh, he loved Corinth. He just hated seeing what they were, what he loved get tarnished. Um, okay. Uh, all right. Uh, is there anything in the chat room? If you, if you have a thought you want us to respond to before we close up the discussion for tonight, put them in all caps right now, and, and we'll, we'll try to address that before we finish up. Sonic um, made a great point. He said, Paul's telling them, hey, you're not being who you are. That's true. They weren't acting who God says they are. God says they're righteous, they're holy, they're his children. And yeah. you're not acting like that if you're uh, serving, you know, fellowshipping with others. Hey, I, I see Mr. Rich Bob is here. Uh, hey, he, Rich Bob. Brother, I'm really happy. I was actually talking to Matthias about you yesterday, I think, or on the phone. Yeah. Wondering about you. I'm real yeah. happy to see you here tonight. So uh, welcome, welcome. Yeah, back. it's been a while, huh, brother Luke? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Good to see him. Very good. Hope you're doing well, brother. Um, okay. Uh, uh, let's let's do our summary remarks here now, uh, brother Cripps. Let's start with you. How would you summarize the the study tonight? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I would summarize it as uh, him laying some things out for the Corinthian church and uh, him capitalizing on a couple of things that he uh, sees some problems with 
and uh, doing it in a way of um, really in a kind way. He's a little sarcastic, I think, at some points, but he's he's presenting it in a way of, of you guys are wise enough to get this, but uh, let me lay it out for you because there's some things going on. I think that um, he's not uh, uh, too happy with. They're kind of saying that in the chat. There was a funny comment uh, someone made about about uh, Paul being the redheaded stepchild of the of the church, uh, which is which is pretty funny. But no, um, uh, it was a it was a good uh, broadcast. I I love getting into these things and uh, uh, comparing what Paul said back then to uh, to today, and we see that. You know, there's reason for it back then, and there's reason for it still today after all this time, uh, because people aren't getting it. Um, but uh, as usual, edifying broadcast, and I love being here. And uh, say good night to the chat and to the panel. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Okay, uh, Sister Renee. Yeah, uh, Liam and Darlene and some others. They were thanking the panel for their fellowship and study but i want to say thank you all because you you guys are just awesome i mean you you guys always <laughs> you're so good you you usually stick right to the subject you're attentive you get involved uh you're loving towards one another uh it's just it's really great to see it and uh so i'm grateful you guys uh are here and so i like to thank the chat I mean, besides uh, thanking Matthias for producing and Brother Luke for hosting and Brother Cribs for always being faithful. And, you know, it's just uh, I really get lifted up whenever we do this Wednesday night study uh, Sunday also. But when we really dig into the word like this line upon line, precept upon precept, and I can hear you guys and. And how touches you and I, I just love it. I love the growth and uh, I, I just love God's word and I love the brethren. So um, this, this was interesting because in a way, if you didn't know better, you'd think that Paul's being contradictory here because he's saying, Hey, it's no big deal. You can eat whatever you want. And then he's saying, Hey, they're fellowship with devils, but we got to see the, what issues is he discussing? Which particular this play tonight in this chapter He's not discussing whether it's okay for someone to eat meat offered to idols. A matter of fact, uh, you're, you shouldn't even um, shouldn't even ask if it was. You know, if somebody serves you something and you don't know about it, you can't get condemned and then eat against your conscience and sin, <laughs> right? <laughs> if you don't know, you can't you can't uh, fall into any sin of doing something in uh, without faith because whatsoever is not a faith is sin. But uh, it's, this is a perfect example of saying uh, uh, something that seems contradictory, but is not. They were just discussing two separate areas of the same issue. Um, so I, I just enjoy really getting into scripture. And I like this because we're able to when people come to us and go, hey, this contradicts such and such, we can go, no, it doesn't. This is this and this is that because we've studied both. You know, it's good to always be armed or to have an, a, what is it, an apologia, I think the word that Peter uses in Greek, you know, to have an answer for our faith. Uh, and it's good to defend it. It really is. So thank you guys. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you for being here, uh, Luke's friends from Tejas. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay, um, Matthias, uh, I want to give you an opportunity to say good night and uh, any any comments you'd like to make. Yeah, well, always edified. Um, and good night. I appreciate it. I, I you guys thank me, but really, I get first row seat for the edification. So it's it's my privilege. No. <laughs> All right, thank you, brother. Uh, well, I guess my my um, I'll sum it up by saying that uh, the, the 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 discussion on each of the verses was interesting. It always is, but I, I think what I uh, the feeling I got from the study tonight was a, a lot of empathy for Paul. I just feel like uh, tonight, I mean, more than usual, I I really felt his frustration 
And, and I know that we all have gone through the same kind of a thing, trying to um, uh, teach the, these, um, these doctrines and principles and, and getting so much flack from so many people and uh, they don't have ears to hear and then they want to make videos calling us false teachers. And, and you know, I, I really identify with, with Paul. They did exactly the same thing to him. And I think tonight we can, I, I really felt his frustration that, gosh, why do I have to keep saying these things? You guys should know this by now. And uh, you're listening to the false teachers and the philosophers and the, uh, uh, the pagans and you're mixing it all up. And, uh, Judaizers. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. Um, I think if we all picked uh, our favorite apostle, um, uh, probably I, I'm guessing Paul has his enemies even today. But I think the majority of us would uh, would uh, probably favor Paul. But uh, I'd be curious what everybody's favorite apostle is. But uh, I really identify with him because he he he's more so than any any other apostle. I can see him under attack even by the Jerusalem church. Uh, and so I, uh, um, I know we're still fighting the, the same fight that he fought. Mm -hmm. And he was a religious man that persecuted and even killed the same. Yeah. Thanks. yeah. He's a wonderful example of God's grace. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so before I say good night, I want to ask our brother Mark here from Texas if he wants you want to say good night or anything. What's your good, thoughts? Good night. And bless you all for doing this. It's it's a pleasure listening to you here. Just keep on doing it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Keep keep him in line while you're there. Don't let uh, brother Luke go into that uh, old uh, gambling habit back. There. That's right. <laughs> Whip him into shape. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think that's going to happen. I've known him a long time, and we've both been saved, and both are different. We're changed, and that's what happens when you're saved. Yeah. All right. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you. Okay, see? Wow, he's terrible now, and I hate to see him before he got saved. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there are, there are stories. I'm sure there are stories. <laughs> Okay, uh, before we get any more on this roast Luke night, uh, I'll, I'll say uh, Luke roast to the chat room. Uh, uh, thanks again, congregation, for being here. Uh, Renee, you have on your Thursday program tomorrow night? Yes, sir, I am. I do not know uh, which guest I will have. Sister Lisa was talking to me about that uh last week and i i have not decided i'm going to contact people my phone completely broke and i've lost everybody's number so mm -hmm. i will uh have someone for tomorrow night and we will have something interesting on our thursday theological throwdown i will be there okay awesome. Renee, uh don't forget to email me your phone number because i don't think i have it I don't think oh I have yes it. and jen's got jen has my number she needs to call me and give me hers again mm -hmm. okay um so uh join sister renee tomorrow night 9 30 eastern time and don't forget friday night we have the fellowship friday 9 30 eastern time on my channel and uh, saturday i want to promote this uh, uh we'll be talking again with um Brother Brian McClurg, uh, we, we, a couple of Saturdays ago, we had a talk on eschatology, and, and it's a great subject. Brother Cripps, uh, Brother McClurg, Matthias, and I, and we're going to talk again this Saturday. I think it's going to be a, a, an ongoing thing, at least for a while, because there's a lot to say about that subject. And then, of course, uh, join us Sunday for our Sunday church uh, service and um, Sunday night. Uh, back with um, Brother Cripps, uh, they'll be back in in action uh, uh, with a totally new uh, approach that I'm e I'm eager to see what they come up with for his uh, his program, True Story Live. Okay, so there you have a lot to look forward to. Okay, congregation and uh, uh, saints on the panel, uh, Matthias, Renee, and Cripps. Thank you. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.